Um, yeah, just to give you a, uh, well, I think you, you don't need any introduction for me, really. You know Will, you know the work he's been up to. The, the Kadroya project is an absolutely thrilling um, Cornish hedge idea. I'm, I'm completely inspired by it myself. I haven't been up and seen it, so I'm hoping to get up and have a look at it. But I think the, uh, the best thing for me to do is to hand over to Will straight away so we can crack on. We're after we saw us. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. And uh, Mittendower, Honor Hagel, what a great crew of people. Um, as the names were popping up, I was going, hello, hello. Crikey, I'm either related to or know <laughs> a, a good proportion of people. So thanks for pitching up. Um, Jess, guess what? Oh, no, I'm in. Sorry, I was about to say I couldn't share, but I can. It's going to let me do this. It's going to let me do it. All I need to do now is get rid of that. Oh, come on. You can do this. Slide show. Play from start. Here we go. Hey, we're in. Right on. So um, I won't go into a huge uh, background about Golden Tree and the various things we've done, um, other than to say that our, our uh, mission is to do stuff that moves people. And therefore, um, even taking something as humble as the Cornish Hedge, we're actually attempting to do something that has an emotional resonance to it and it it's people where it matters. Um, I actually need to begin this spiel with saying something about Cornwall Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. It was their 60th birthday in 2019 um, and they put out a call saying, how should we celebrate the amazing outstanding natural beauty of the Cornish landscape. Mm. The AOMB have got a couple of little issues. Um, and one of them is that nobody can agree what beauty is. Certainly nobody knows what's natural, um, but even worse, they're not even an area. Because actually the AOMB is 12 separate chunks that is split all around Cornwall, lots of all the pretty bits of the coast. Um, and then the chunk in the middle is Bobman Moor. And generally speaking, this was you know, decided by somebody who had a map in an office, probably based up London town or some such, uh, 60 years ago. And there are various places where you go, well, that's a little bit arbitrary. Why have you decided that's pretty and that ain't and that's in and that's out? And people generally don't know much about the AOMB or its work or why it exists. And I don't think I've ever met anyone who's woken up in the morning and said, I'm so glad that I live in South Coast Western. In other words, then the nomenclature is also very bizarre. I mean, that's the lizard, isn't it, my buddies? It's not South Coast Western. And so the idea of raising the profile of the OMB is an interesting challenge. How do we do that? How do we do that in a way that somehow unites the landscape right across Cornwall and maybe even ignores some of those rather arbitrary dotted lines? Well, three things about our landscape geology, ecology, humans. So obviously the geology of Cornwall is, is very, very special. And as this is being hosted by Pinwith Landscape Partnership, I thought we'd better start with a pretty picture of Pedden and Willaz. Pedden and Willaz, you may translate that as land's end, but Pedden means head. So I call it land's beginning. This gate granite lump that we all know and love is not the whole story of Cornwall, is it? Because 480 million years ago, when it was thrusting up, you know that what had happened just previously was a continent's worth of fossilized fish poo screaming across the Atlantic at about a quarter of an inch a century, screaming and thundering into what we now call Europe and making what were the very tallest mountains that have ever existed in the history of the planet were here in what we now call Cornwall. And so all around this central granite batalith, you've got all these, these twistings and, and uh, uh, foldings of the, the shillus and the, and the killus. Um, and that's, of course, what renders the extraordinary geological diversity of Cornwall. And I am told reputedly by Canberra School of Mines that we are the most geologically diverse patch of the entire planet. Now, that's an important thing because geology 
affects soil and soil affects ecology. And of course, as you go around Cornwall, the micro variations of geology render these extraordinary diverse ecological places. And you get an extra brownie point if you can tell me what that beautiful yellow plant is. Ah, it's not just gorse though, is it? That's Cornish fuzz, Elix gallii. That is a separate species to Elix europaeus. Um, and of course, you've got the two different heather species there, the grey glens, you've got, um, you've got the Kaluna and the Erica. And it's just a, just a little example of the extraordinary uh, bountifulness of ecology as we wander around Cornwall, part of our landscape. But the third component is human beings. And humans have always intervened with the landscape. So here are some humans intervening with landscape uh, and doing their best to make a bit of an impact. That particular picture um, is actually Polkanugo near Mabe. But if we want to get down Penwith again, Nick, just because you know, I want you to feel that you're loved. Um, what I love about this picture is that's the shot, my darlings, on every bloody calendar and postcard and pretty picture. And, and, it's, and it's up front and central of the Penwith section of the area of outstanding natural beauty. Look at that. Look at those human beings intervening with geology and creating a massive impact on the landscape, which we now do so much to try and preserve and, and make sure that those engine houses don't fall any further over the cliff, etc. etc. So we've got these, we've got these three components of our landscape. We've got rocks, we've got living stuff, and included in living stuff, we've got humans. What is there that combines all three of those elements uh, in an impact in the landscape? And here's your answer, still in Pinwith. This is, of course, an aerial view of Bazeeglen. Yeah, you noticed. Um, so this is Bazeeglen, and there we have got the Cornish hedges, which are this extraordinary combination of all those three factors, stone, natural living systems, and human beings. And here's a close up of one of those hedges. Just pause for a moment to look at the dirty great grounders at the bottom. The National Trust have been in under these and they've pulled out uh, the soil samples and the pollen and such like, and they have definitively shown these hedges, these grounders were put in place 4,000 years ago. We're talking Stonehenge, we're talking pyramids. We are talking the oldest structures on the planet that are still in use for their original function. The oldest structures on the planet still in use for their original function. That's 4,000 years of letting your cows get out. So we love the Cornish hedge. And I suppose we better point out that just at this point, just in case there's anybody zooming in from um, up in Englandshire, not a hedge, my lovelies, not a line of fuzzy bushes, that's a hedge row, not a dry stone wall, let's be clear about that, not a dry stone wall, but something that is very distinct and very definite. Uh, and actually, the, if you want to find uh, analogies and comparable structures in other patches of the planet, you join up with our megalithic Atlantic culture and you have to nip over to Wales, Brittany, even Galicia, um, to find anything similar. Right. A Cornish hedge has a huge amount of folklore, wisdom, technology um, contained within it. And they're one of these really bits of kind of, it's like an indigenous knowledge base um, that we've been privileged to be a part of uh, in this project. And I have to make sure that you're clear, I am not a blinking master hedger. When we did a manage and everyone thought I was a, a miner and was set, claiming to have worked down Crofty with me just because I had a hat. Um, same with this hedge. I'm not claiming to be a master hedger. Dot, dot, dot. Yet. Right. So I'm sure every one of you knows what a grounder is, don't you? It does what it says it is. These are the big boulders at the base that uh, are essentially the foundation. They're half below the ground level and, and, and largely above. The word shiners does mean different things in different parts of Cornwall, but essentially it, it's talking about stones that are fully on view 
um, but are part of the random filler courses that go up to the line. Notice the line. Above the line, what do you get then? Oh, not above the line, sorry. The word batter is probably the single most important concept to understand as to why a Cornish hedge is not uh, a dry stone wall and why it works so blinking well and why it stands up for 4,000 years. And that is because they are constructed with this extraordinary curve. And you can either think of a, um, one of Alfred Wallace's lighthouses or a, an oak tree or something. Um, and at, or the other way of thinking of it is a keystone arch on its side. And actually the pressure pushes in and in. And the more the pressure pushes down, if it's properly built, it won't bulge, it'll do the opposite. It will just lock tighter and tighter. Um, up along the top here, you've got edgers. Now, uh, this is one of Patrick Simmons, um when West Pen Penwith Beauties. I don't know, but I believe that if I came out with a tape measure, that would be exactly seven inches. That would be exactly six inches. And that would be exactly five inches. That's the kind of accuracy that these things are built with. You've got a tob off. And your tobs are the turfs, which are, of course, recycled from the very adjacent turf and thereby uh, retain the seed bank of the very place you're building. And now there's a contentious issue around rab. Now, Patrick and the Guild will tell you you have to have proper rab, which is a subsoil that doesn't have organic com uh, components to it, so it doesn't rot down and cause vacuum, but will remain did a PhD, not a PhD, did a MA uh, on it. And he went around and, and drew samples out from inside the hedges and discovered that a lot of them were just built with ordinary topsoil, not rab. Don't tell Patrick that. It's meant to be rab. We all know that. Right. It goes further in terms of the perfect Cornish hedge. Now, this work is based on the late, great Robin Muneer. And if you haven't been onto Robin Muneer's uh, archive website, you're missing a treat because he is a man who should have had a PhD, if not a professorship on Cornish hedging. And here's the, here's the basic idea that most people agree about this mathematics. Your base width equals your height below the top. And that it's effectively sits within a square. And that's give or, give or take true pretty much as you go around and you find a completed hedge. From here on, they're a little bit less uh, rigid, but essentially the top width is half of the base width. Happy so far? Stand by. Robin Muneer wanted to define the batter. So he went to a load of hedges and created an invisible imaginary vertical line with a pole or whatever, and measured the distance from that invisible imaginary line at half at a quarter and at three quarters. And he came up with this set of ratios. That whatever, this is all based on that unit of being the width of the hedge. So every time you build a hedge, my lovelies, I want, expect you to be doing, now it's gotta be inches and feet, of course. Can you give me two ninths of four foot eight? Go on. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, <laughs> Nobody goes out into those fields, my buddies, and does that sort of mathematics. And in fact, um, the Guild contests Robin's maths. But again, I think it's about micro variations as you go around Cornwall. Because when I've been looking at the ones up on Bobman Moor, the batter is more curved than the ones in Penwith. And again, it might be to do with the fact that granite has a... a a locking together because it's so rough, you can get away with less of a less of a batter than you might need if you're using, say, killis. Now, the way the guild cope with this, this is a shot of your every every hedger's uh, little working kit, and that bit of kit there, my darlings, do you know what that is? That is a former, and that is that is a guild former. So. The, the cultural heritage of that precise curve actually goes back to um, uh, oh, Jethro's dad, Hugh Rowe. Um, uh, 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 and so that is a West Penwith batter that is now 
pretty much becoming the batter across the whole of Cornwall. And you can see that it's got a little, um, what do you call those things again? Spirit level in the top. So you know whether you've got that upright and you know whether your batter's sweeping at the right level or no. But even that, it's a fairly technical piece of kit. Now what, this is a picture of our master hedger, Sean, uh, Sean Williams. And he's working here down in southeast Cornwall at Lansullis with some very tickly shillis that's very flaky and small. And you can see he's created a, um, a plywood former. In fact, he's created two. And then you see the little nails. He runs cord around. And here's a photo to show how he's working with two formers made of plywood to make sure that that, that batter, that curb is absolutely correct the whole way. But even that, do they all really adhere to that level of technical proficiency? This guy's brilliant. Um, his name's Ryan, and he's building here down at Pradanic uh, on the Lizard. And you can see the lovely array of gabbro, granite, and serpentine in the hedge. You can see his, you can see his former behind him. Is he using it? He might use it a bit now and again. You know what he uses mostly? His shovel. When you put a Cornish shovel, against the grinder the the blade of the shovel and the if you get the if you get the line of the shovel vertical the blade angle gives you the slope of your grinder and then after that you do it by eye and it's like so many of these things like learning to drive and being told all those very complicated mirror signal maneuvers and then you end up doing it instinctively and so with most hedgers they actually build in a fairly instinctive manner Right. So the point being that as you go around Cornwall, you've got all these very, very different kinds of stone, which lead to a very, very different pattern and texture on the face. And they're a thing of great beauty. And uh, my missus is becoming a hedge widow. Uh, I mean, I'm driving down the lane, hit the brakes, back up and go, oh, look at the batter on that. <laughs> um, you become a, such a geek. I mean, I just want to show you this beautiful thing here over there. That's Boscastle, and there are two types of rock. There's these great lumps of white quartz that they use for their grinders and then the random fill. And then they use the black slate with random vertical courses, and there's not really a proper horizontal line at any point. These hedges are so beautiful when you're in that hedge. It's really something. I mean, this up the top right is a classic Jack and Jenny. Some people call it herringbone. Uh, etc. Um, this one down here is, is classic around the whole of the mining country of Redruth, etc. All of that's kill us. Uh, or, well, sorry, all of that is, is mining atoll. It's atoll that's come up from underground and uh, there's so much of it and lying around. And you know that down in West Pimwith, some of those hedges are like 10 foot wide because they've got so much blinking stone come up from underground. So we love Cornish hedges. We love the way they've defined and impacted um, our landscape and the way they respond to the microgeology of place. But of course, the extraordinary thing is their ecological importance. So when you're building this hedge, we're, we're being told that inside that hedge is a, a soil bank that retains a, a species array that is pre-agricultural. So if you're talking about hedges having been put in place in some cases, 4,000 years ago, but even if places were enclosed, um, you know, in the great enclosures through the, say, the 17th and 18th and even 19th century, you're still using soil that has the species that were there before agriculture. By the way, prof um, Professor, she ain't no professor, Anne Reynolds at Cornwall Council is the expert on fields and field shapes and systems. And it's fascinating if you ever get a chance to hear her talk about how you can read the landscape and you can look at Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, right through to Industrial Age enclosures, essentially based on the shape of the fields themselves. But what we're talking about here is the ecology. We are told that hedges uh, support over 600 species of flowering plants. And that those flowering plants in turn are uh, host homes to more than 10,000 invertebrate species. 
That's a staggering number when you consider the drastic uh, pollinator decline that we're in proper crisis about. Um, and of course, those invertebrates themselves then, uh, oh, by the way, that's, that's a Cornish black bee. That's, none of the, oh, that's in there for Hillary. Um, um, that's a Cornish black bee. The, the idea being that there are genetic strains that are, that are specifically adapted to the ecology and climate of, of different places. Um, the, the invertebrates are themselves, uh, they're prey animals and you work all your way up the system until you've got like, that booty gate barn owl um, cruising along the hedge at the top looking for his voles. Um, so these, the, the carbon sequestration, the species retention, the corridors through geo, uh, the corridors through, through space as well as corridors back through time. We love Cornish hedges. Don't we just love them? The thing is, I've, I've, I've been ranting on about Cornish hedges, but the AOMB want us to celebrate the whole landscape. And uh, at the moment, we're saying, I've got rocks, I've got ecology, and here are the human beings. That, by the way, if you look closely, not one of those human beings is on an Xbox. They're, they're out in the world doing something physical that uses their brain that is, that is, that is skillful and has an aesthetic component um, and, and a cultural component. What are we going to say to the OMB? We're going to say, let's do something to celebrate your 60th birthday in our landscape. Let's build something out of hedge. Now, this is where I admit something in public I've never said before. This idea I've actually had for about 20 years. I actually pitched this idea to Tim Smith back in the first days of Eden, and he's been sitting in a drawer waiting for me to go uh, for ages. And I was looking at, ooh, I forgot to tell you something. I was going to, sorry, back off and change direction. Um, the Guild of Cornish Hedges. Just want to, I just want to flag up the importance of this very critical organisation. And that's uh, Andy Cockshaw um, talking to people up on Aggie, uh, up at the cliffs there. Uh, the, the Guild of Cornish Hedges tell us there's currently 30,000 miles of hedge. Really, re repair cycle ahead should be about 200 miles worth of hedge ought to be in repair each year. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the, although it's hard to get statistics on it, we reckon about 60 miles that uh, a bit were being lost a year, although we're hopeful that rate has slowed down, he says, looking at them crunching through with the new A30 and uh, whole new towns of rabbit hutches springing up the front and centre. But like, for instance, on that new A30, they are demanding Cornish hedges. So we are, we're aware of 25 miles worth of Cornish hedge that needs to be built. You know, and there's about six people <laughs> who, who have that level of skill to do it properly, etc. I'm exaggerating. But there is a bottleneck in terms of the skills and the knowledge, and we need a whole new generation of hedgers coming up through. All right. Uh, yes, all, all the old buggers is old boys. It's true. Uh, we had one female hedger, uh, and unfortunately, she sustained an injury. Uh, um, so at the moment, we're hoping to train a whole new cohort of people of every possible uh, description, gender, and type uh, to become the next generation of Cornish hedgers. Sorry, back to building something in the landscape. And if we're going to go back, let's go back a few thousand years. We've been building circular stuff in the landscape for a long, long time, right back to that megalithic culture. And when I first pitched this idea, actually, I thought that this also was about three or 4,000 years old. That's what we were told at the time. Turns out it's nothing like that old. Um, this is the Rocky Valley Labyrinth carved in the fairly soft slate up at, uh, between uh, Tintagelbos Castle. And um, it's about that big and you can run your finger around it. It now appears it was probably carved with its friend by the miller on an off day waiting for the blinking flower to grind in, in the water mill. And it actually was once within the curtilage, within the kind of shed of the mill itself. So it would have even been an indoor wall. Anyhow, it's only 300 years old. Hmm. 
I don't care. This one is on, uh, this is Troy Town. Troy Town is relevant because of the name Kerr Troya is a Cornish transliteration of uh, Troy Town. Um, this is on Aggie, uh, on, this is on Agnes on the Isles of Scilly. Um, again, it turns out it's probably only about 300 years old as well. So during that time, the Enlightenment, this, this image of the labyrinth got taken up and re-celebrated. But it, the symbol itself is much older. Here's an example from Galicia, just across the pond, with our megalithic cousins in what we now call northwestern Spain. That is 4,000 years old. Um, and, and, and it goes on and on. These examples are walkable examples, a bit more like the St. Agnes one. And they're often found on islands. They, they're all the way up uh, the coast of Scandinavia. And th th these are on the, the Bolshoi Skitskitskitski islands of northern Russia, and there are 21 of them. Wow. And they are the fully, fully 4,000 ish years old. So, from what we now call Turkey, all the way through the Mediterranean, all the way up the entire Western Atlantic arc of Europe, these labyrinths exist uh, and therefore will have them. <laughs> Here's, this one's 4,000 years old, I'm sure. Uh, well, it might be a little bit more recent. But the point is that there's a, there's a kind of breadth of interest in these um, and a whole range of different reasons why people love them. I suppose I ought to just quickly point out the difference between a maze and a labyrinth. <laughs> and the uh, uh, mazes are puzzles. Uh, and they have dead ends and multiple choices. Labyrinths have a single meandering path which you can walk along in meditation of your sins um, or of uh, the glorious creation of the world. Um, people just say, in a maze you get lost, in a labyrinth you find yourself. <laughs> right on. Anyway, I actually quite like uh, the fact that this is a temporary little labyrinth that gets washed away at the next tide. And I, and I do just need to make it clear that our entire project is a, a temporary structure. People have misunderstood that. Um, whereas I've made it very clear, it's only there for about 4,000 years is, it, is, is the temporary thing, all right? That's me making a joke. And because I can't hear you, I don't know if anyone sniggered or not. <laughs> right, let's crack on. Where are we gonna build this idea of a labyrinth made entirely out of Cornish hedging? Well, there are all those different AONB bits. And actually, it jumps out that if you're going to make something that somehow unites the lot, it's got to be in the middle at Bob and Moore. So I picked up the phone and rang somebody I knew at Southwest Lakes Trust. And he, he, the synchronicity was extraordinary. He said, I've just come out of um, a conversation in which we've been talking about what are we going to do up at the Colliford Lake car park? It's overgrown, it's disused, the, you've got all kinds of antisocial behavior, there's vandalism. What are we gonna do? And I went, build a labyrinth? And they went right on. So we found ourselves an overgrown car park to have a go at building ourselves a labyrinth. This is the uh, artist's impression. Now, a couple of quick little things. Um, obviously, the original notion was that the entirety of the thing would be built of Cornish Hedge. Um, the cost implication of that is enormous. We had uh, a, a big disappointment in funding um, when a particular organization that won't be named, Highways England, um, we were led to believe they were gonna fund us and then they pulled out. Um, so we had to come up with a compromise. It doesn't close the door on us one day completing the entire thing, but at the minute, the map of Cornwall and the outer perimeter are all of full scale Cornish hedging, whereas the other earth, the other ones are created from earth bund. I'll explain that in a minute. So here's the, here is the landscape architect's plans. And you can see how we've superimposed the footprint of Cornwall over the shape of the labyrinth. And the notion is these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, those are each of the chunks representing each of the AOMB styles and types of stone. Now, I will just point out at this point, we have got no idea how we're gonna pull that off. We haven't got the money for it. 
we haven't got a plan. Jessica, I can see, is laughing. Um, it's an idea, and I really like it. And at some point, we're going to be asking you, like, if you're sitting in Pimwith at the moment, have you got about five tonne of nice Pimwith granite we can add to do this bit down here? You know, at some point, we're going to try and find the stone. It'll be, a, you know, a lorry load uh, worth of each one. Uh, and, and so when you're walking the labyrinth, you are uh, experiencing all these different beautiful styles, as you can see down the side of this picture. And here she is. So last uh, autumn, under the radar somewhat, and, and with all kinds of COVID restrictions, we just bloody made a start. We didn't have enough money to finish it. We didn't know how we were going to put it off. But we worked with Laveni, who um, uh, are builders based right there in uh, St. Leot Parish. And we had a father and son team, the Bettisons, and uh, Grandpa Bettison was born in the cottage, which is now underwater in the lake right next door to this um, site. So they are they're they're Bobman Moore, born and bred. And they, he, um, old Arthur Bettison told me that he had seven uncles, and every one of them worked as a Cornish hedger <laughs> back in the day. Right, there's where we got to so far, and what you're actually looking at is the fact that the grinders are now in place for the whole thing and we're proud of that and you can see the ragel here that's the that's the supply of granite where did the granite come from well some of it came from um, a farm just about two miles away where of course over the years they pulled out hedges but some of it um, came from under that water so this, this photo lets you see uh, where the labyrinth is situated in, in relation to the lake and how close it was. And last summer, we were watching the tide go out. Another little joke, everybody. It's not really tidal. Um, we were watching the, the water level fall and fall and fall. There's all these people, thirsty people down the scars were drinking up quicker than the stream was trickling in. Uh, and so we put out a shout for volunteers to come and help us get granite from below the waterline. This is yet another Pinwith moment. Look, that, that's Greg Martin's missus and, um, and boy. Um, uh, and he took that photo of them loustering away. Uh, and there's several people on this call who I, I've already recognized as came on that day. And like a team of uh, Egyptian slaves building a pyramid, they, uh, they, they lifted all this granite and all they got back was a proper Cornish pasty from Phil Newcastle at the end of the day. But the thing is, we weren't allowed to take a diesel uh, machine to, to help. It had to be done with human or with us. So we roped in David Jones um, and his, his fine beasts. And um, the, uh, people, people formed human change. And so I'm proud of this because before they drowned that valley, there used to be Cornish hedges snaking all the way across it. And of course, when they drowned it, all the soil fell away and the, and, and the granite fell to the, fell to the ground. Well, that means that every stone we've been picking up has been pre-selected as a good hedging stone by some old person back in the day, maybe quite a few hundred years ago. Um, and we are now recycling that on site with literally zero uh, carbon footprint. So I'm, I'm quite proud of that little detail. I just wanted to say a quick word about the heart of Kajoya um, and this fine pair of gentlemen, as you can see, um, uh, Gary uh, ha has trained his beard to be a hawthorn tree uh, of Bob Moore Stiley with the wind pruning taking it. Uh, I, that, that shows great commitment, I think. Uh, and so this is father and son, Gary and Thomas Thrussell. They are physically the nearest neighbours to the Kajoya site. Their farm and workshop is literally just over the hedge. We put out a call to come up with a good idea for an artwork and a piece that you would find when you got to the centre of the labyrinth. We, it, it, everyone got scores. Uh, we had a, a very interesting and wide range of applications from well beyond Cornwall. Um, we, it all went through to a panel and uh, they all got rigorously examined and questioned. 
and these dear boys won. And the poetry of them winning the commission when they live right next door to it, I just, I couldn't have been happier than that. And of course, their idea was, was very simple. When you get to the center of the labyrinth, you find a labyrinth because it's a labyrinth within the labyrinth inside the labyrinth that is your mind of the cosmos, which is the macrocosmos of the labyrinth of eternity and things like that, as that. So the other beautiful little detail of this is that it catches rainwater and the water runs around the eternal single path and disappears down the plug hole in the middle. There's another secret, I'll tell you. When we were doing the stone lifting, we also found several Bronze Age arrowheads. So there we are, early Bronze Age, 4,000 years ago. It all ties to the same little window frame. And there's a wonderful guy called um, Dave Eddie Vian. And he took this beautiful Bronze Age arrowhead and cast one. And he cast it in bronze. And we placed that as a little, a little sacrificial moment inside, underneath that dais, which can never be got at again. So there's a little bronze arrowhead cast from a bronze age arrowhead right in the middle. But no one knows about that. So that's in. The heart of is in. Oh, and we made um, a series of little films about the about them, how they constructed this. And if you go on to YouTube and look at the heart of Kadroya, there are actually four in a row showing the process. Um, and it's a lovely thing. Lots of beautiful drone shots from Gemma Waring. I recommend you having a little look at, on YouTube. Um, I just wanted to say a little word about the uh, wider community work that we've been doing. So um, we've already worked with 12 schools and we've got another round coming up now. All those kids who were in the uh, juniors, most of them, they've gone up into the comp. And we're going back to those 12 schools, adding another five schools. And this is what Jessica's working on over this summer term. Um, and so I can't remember what the figure is totally, um, but it's uh, 17 times a class worth, which is a big number of children who get to meet a real Cornish hedger, get to learn how to do it. And some of them are going to get to actually make a little treasure capsule to bury inside the, uh, the Kajoya Labyrinth. Um, it's a lovely thing. So here we are. You are now being shown a very recent photo. This is from last Monday. Uh, and this is on site. And this is the stunningly beautiful work of Sean Williams. Um, and he has deliberately begun work on the tightest curve, which is the hardest thing to pull off. An external curve is a very hard thing to maintain correct batter and to keep all of those stones pinned. Jess and I were up there talking to Sean about it, and, and he can talk a lot more than I can about the details and the skill. And he said, if, if we took him to a hedge that he had built, he can remember every single stone he has ever put in a hedge. That's what he says. And no, you know, we, he, so we'll see that one there. It's got a little bit at the back where actually it hooks onto the one next to it, and that one over there just manages to hold it in. And he can talk you through each stone in that manner. It's extraordinary. And yes, these are exactly seven inches, six inches, and five inches. Does he measure them? No. He just knows. Right. That's what it looks like at the moment, my darlings. And at the moment, he's made a start up there on his own. But before very long, we are rechristening this whole site as the Outdoor University of Cornish Agent. And um, we're offering a whole wide range. And there may be some people on this call who fancy getting their hands involved. That's my boy Tom up to Boar's Castle. Um, so we've got a two day course. So that's if you just go, I've got a bit falling down bottom of my garden and actually I want to know how to put it back up again without making a complete pig's ear of it. We've got five day courses, which is a little bit more serious. Like I really do know how to build hedges. We've got a 10 day course, which you then actually get a certificate. Not the full blinking, uh, you haven't become a Cornish Edger in 10 days. No, 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 no. That's, that is a 50 day course. Um, that's special appointment only. Uh, but the, we've negotiated with the Guild of Cornish Hedges that rather than just the Master Hedges um, Award, 
there is this certificate you can have for 10 days. Um, and at the end of 10 days, you, you've had a good old whack and you, you know, you can, you can, you can, that 10 days is the foundation for going on to becoming a fully fledged accredited hedger. All right. It might be that uh, you would like to have a go at a bit of that training and that's the publicity around that's going to be happening fairly soon. Although if you didn't want to go up there yourself and yet you still wanted to somehow contribute and make your mark, we have got this thing going, the hedge pledge. And I know there are some people on this call who've already taken part in this, whereby you buy a yard of hedge and you get a little plaque, not, a, not quite as big as that. It's a bit smaller than that, but it's made by the Strussels and you get to write your special words on your yard of hedge. Um, and some of the things we've had in have been really gorgeous. Uh, remembering people who've passed on, uh, celebrating a wedding, celebrating a new birth, um, all sorts of things of that nature. Uh, so do have a look at hedgepledge.co.uk if you fancy owning a yard of Kerno. Um, and I think that's all I need to say, unless Jess tells me there's something that I've forgotten to mention. So um, we're, we're, we're cracking on. Um, we'll be work up there on site all this summer. The chances of us finishing it by September are pretty damn slim, which means we'll be back working out how the heck we fund another summer up there. Who knows? But I think it's, people say, people say, when's it going to be finished? And I say, directly. Come on, um, come back in about 50 to 100 years. I reckon it'll be pretty nice. All right. Is that enough? Are you happy, Nick? Thumbs That's up. That's fantastic. Will, thank oh. you so much. It's just uh, it's inspirational stuff, isn't it? I want to get out there. I, I spend all my time looking at hedges anyway, and I want to get out there and have another look and start building one. It's just fantastic. So, yeah, thank you so much for that. Brilliant. OK, we'll move on quickly because we've got the, the poll and then questions. So. Jessica, can I hand over to you to tell us how we're going to do the poll? Yes, yeah, certainly. I'm sorry, everyone, to have to ask you a few quick questions before um, uh, we you get to ask questions. But it, um, we've never done this before. So what should happen right now is I'm launching the poll and something should pop up. Um, and uh, if you could just, it's just like six multiple choice questions, if you wouldn't mind. I'm sorry, I know it's a pain, but as that last shot showed, we've had lots of people put money into this project. And um, I'm sure you all understand, they like to know um, where their money's going, basically, and who's interested. And um, yeah, if you've enjoyed yourself, that's the main thing. Um, so if you could just take two minutes to do that, that would be amazing. Um, I will also mention that um, if you want to join our broader mailing list, I know Will gave the training address, but it's uh, the same address, but just with hello, um, or you can go to our website and there's a um, direct link if you want to join our general mailing list and hear not just about Kadroya, but about the other work that Golden Tree do, um, like the Cornish language programmes um, and all sorts of things. Um, so... Great, I can see, I, it's, a, it's anonymous by the way, the poll, I should have mentioned that. Um, I can't see who's answering what, we just get some numbers. So we'll just give you another minute on that. If you just wanna be having a think also about any questions you'd like to ask Will, and then we'll do that directly. I think even, Will, even I keep learning new things all the time. I thought I knew everything there was to know about hedges, but. There's always a bit more. Um, I would like to pick up on uh, what Nick said earlier about Craig's wonderful little film about Cornish hedges. It's, uh, I mean, Craig, Craig, Craig can make any subject uh, a delight, uh, and he's done a, a cracking job of that. And these, you know, really enjoyable activity sheets that uh, he's produced for the Penrith Learning Partnership as well. So I do recommend people, um, uh, basically, he's, he's a lot funnier than me and gets it all over and done within about seven minutes. So you haven't got to, uh, <laughs> you haven't got to listen to me bang on for 40. I think that video is really good if, if there's people who you'd like to share the interest with, but you, they, you think they might go, no, I'm not interested in hedges. I think it's a good converting tool. 
Uh, oh, great. Oh, you've nearly all just, um, I think that's, I think that might actually be everyone because it's apart from the host. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to end that. Um, I've just seen in the chat, Chrissy, was your, your maiden name was Betterton. I didn't know that. Are you related to the uh, the Bobman Moore Hedging tribe? <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're worth they're worth getting to know, Chrissy. Um, there there's some characters. I've actually I recorded the old man. I I, I interviewed him, and I've got a tape in well, you know, the tape. Is it? It's an audio file. But I have got him talking about Hedron and about his family. So at some so, point, I mean, rocks must be in the blood because I'm a geologist. There you are. See. <laughs> <laughs> um. So if you've got any questions, if you, you can just put your name if you want and we'll go through and then I'll get you can ask your question directly or you can um, ask. Um, someone's asked about tours. Well, um, just to say once the site is open to the public, um, you won't need a tour. You can just go and experience it. Um, and there is, in fact, going to be an app which uh, you can use when you're on site. So it will trigger when you get on site with your phone and it will give you a story that's linked to the walk around the site. Um, so there'll be uh, some information for you available digitally. We can't really staff tours at the moment, but um, yeah, so, but, but hopefully by the time it's all finished, it will guide you, I think is uh, uh, just um, think. I'll just say a quick word on that if you like. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Will. Just the fact that it, the, the site is not open to the public uh, and it, it, and won't be open this summer. Um, it, it, there may be some occasions if we can find, uh, a, you know, there might be some occasions where we want people to come up on site to volunteer, those sorts of things. Um, yes, Jess mentioned the app. Um, it's something that I've been developing in cahoots with Falmouth Uni. Um, uh, and I set them a challenge of creating a gaming app which made teenagers turn it off and notice the landscape. Uh, whether we've achieved that or not, I don't know, but we've used the legend of Jan for Giggle. I'm sure that uh, such people as Tom and Barbara Tanuan will be really glad to hear that Tregeagle is coming back out the box. Um, uh, and the endless tasks of Tregeagle working his way around the whole of Cornwall is the framing for this app. Um, don't hold your breath. I. <laughs> I don't understand these things. It, it, I'm too blinking old, but I'm sure there are young people who think it's wonderful. Um, question from Kay Richards. I don't know, Kay, do you know how to unmute yourself? Would you like to just ask your question directly about um, protection of hedges? Yes, I am. It's Clive, actually. I've accidentally signed in under my microphone. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the beard proves that a bit. Um, I was, I've done some background work for a neighbourhood plan uh, in our parish, and um, it became apparent when I was doing that that all these hedges have no yep. green protection. That's right. And uh, it seems uh, travesty to me that we're all sitting here talking about there are about 30,000 miles of hedges, and, and it has no protection, it has all this abandoned. And even Cornwall haven't worked, so it doesn't, or don't seem to have worked on this aspect. And it seems a great gap in, uh, in the status. Sir, I concur entirely. And thank you for working at a parish level. I think if a, every one of us looked after our parish, the entire globe would have minders, wouldn't it? Uh, I'm a great believer in, in thinking global and acting local. I'm also an unashamed Cornish nationalist. And um, of course, the people in London who make the legislation haven't included the Cornish hedge any more than they, they know how to spend our tax money to avoid the blight of second homes, for instance. Um, actually, the, the, the issue is that this word hedge means something different in England. And it means, oh, we've got to protect that because it's full of these species and it's got a, a real importance. Uh, uh, and at no point has anybody managed to raise the idea that in Cornwall there's a thing called a Cornish hedge that isn't necessarily got a hedgerow on the top of it, but it deserves um, being preserved. Um, and 
what I would like to see is I'd like to see a far better regulation around the whole thing. So, for instance, you may or may not have, uh, if you've been to Penzance recently, seen the heliport and the thing that is technically uh, been put up to be called a Cornish hedge. Well, actually, it's been a load of rock. It's like it's, it's like Granny's rockery. That's what it looks like, and it's been done with a machine. And they just piled it up and chucked a load of PTE soil in the middle and said, that's conscious. Tick, we've met the requirement. And actually what we need to do is have a much better uh, set of what qualifies as a Cornish hedge. And we do need to see it um, move through planning, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And we've got a long way to go to make it happen. Yeah, okay. If you make the definition too narrow, it uh, limits the protection. Well, that is a problem as well. Better to be all inclusive, isn't it? I completely agree with you as well, because um, there are, of course, quite it's it, it's a broad church, and 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 we were up on Bob Moore with the um, a film crew the other day looking for some um, some stuff to film, and there was one place where this hedge, beautiful hedge, it became a dry stone wall, and then it turned back into a hedge. It was like within a hundred yards. They've completely changed it from one thing to the other and back again. Um, yeah. So you, you do need to be quite uh, eclectic in your inclusivity. Where should one uh, exert pressure? Wow, that's an interesting question. I'm not really qualified to answer that, I'm afraid, Clive. Um, uh, I, I, I think as we're talking, I mean, Cornwall Council are the single biggest funder of the training programme. Um, and there are there are some good ears there, um, and they're they're open to being educated. And I would hope that through the planning department, we might be able to make some moves. It'd be a good thing. Somebody sounds like it. Something that someone like Nick Taylor of the Pinwith Landscape uh, <laughs> Partnership might uh, take on as part of his job list. He's got nothing to do in lockdown, see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I, I can actually add to that because it is something I've actually been, been wrestling with. And so one of the conclusions that I've personally come to is that perhaps one of the best ways that we can um, encourage sort of greater protection is just to tell people and just get the message out there about these absolutely fantastic things. And the fact that they're not just historically important, actually in the future, they're going to be of great value. We had... Um, Alistair Driver, who's the director of Rewilding Britain, come down and pay a visit. He'd never been to Cornwall before. And he saw a Cornish hedge and he said, that is your future. That is where the biodiversity is. So, we, you know, they're, they're just, they're precious in so many ways. And I think if we can just keep getting that message out there, out there, out there, that's that's um, going to be our, you know, our best, uh, our best sort of angle. Having said that, I have got somebody who's got a very good legal mind working on exactly this, pulling apart all of the legislation, finding out what's what's happened in the past, why it hasn't been taken any further, because undoubtedly they are worthy of much greater protection. So so it's yeah, it's a it's a mystery, really. And I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's got to be changed. Um, I think we've just got. Well, there's a couple of questions. One was yours, Nick, which was about Penwith styles. And then Hilary wanted to just ask um, about where where do we send our favourite hedge pictures? Um, anyone else wants, we will have time for a couple more after that. So if anyone has got anything else, stick your name or question in the chat. OK, my my quick question. I'll just answer that one about the, the picture. There's a there's a, um, a competition on the Penwith Landscape Partnership website. So if you go onto the website, um, there's an explanation for how to send in photos, and that'd be great. Hopefully, we can get a nice gallery up from, from that. Nick, I have to warn you, I've got more photos of hedges on my <laughs> phone than I have <laughs> my children, my dog, I know. anything. I know, it's hedges. terrible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, my, my question, Will, quickly the, the, um, I love the idea of having the different styles overlaying the map of Cornwall, but when it comes down to Penwith, down in St Just, you've got the lovely Guild, Patrick Simmons, beautiful hedges. But then you get up to Zena and it goes all all random. You know, we've got all of these lovely big chunks of granite. And are we going to have any of that in the Kadroya, um, uh, in the labyrinth? Or is that not is that not feasible? Do you think? Yes, it is. It is, it is feasible indeed. Uh, so just to to touch on that thing about style, 
there's always the individual hedger style as well. So there's the stuff that you learned as you were growing up, and then there's the stuff. I mean, I, I've got a mate, I can tell he's hedged because he loves to put in little vertical ties that I don't think look very good, but he thinks it looks beautiful, you know. Um, so there, there, there is an individual thing. Um, there's also some of those huge wide ones down in West Penwith are because of all the mining at all. And they just have such a quantity of stone. Um, there's definitely a whole thing about how far are you going to move the size of this stone? So like if you have, if you're dealing with a dirty gate boulder, you're going to, you're going to use it as close as possible to where it already is. If not move the entire hedge to take in the boulder rather than have to move the damn thing. Um, th there are, there are so many of those variations. Um, one of the most beautiful hedges I ever remember seeing, see, I remember every hedge, um, at Bos Porthenis in, 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 in West Penwith, which is definitely one of the proper ancient ones. And I think you're probably referring to this very random style. There's no edges at all. The whole thing is random and, and it creates a beautiful harmony. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I, I'll just mention one other thing as well. So, so um, I, when I was living in West Penwith at Basian, um, the hedges there were all tombstone hedges. So they were actually a single row of dirty, great, um, almost like lintels. Um, and then other stones were piled in a really precarious manner on top of it. No rab, no fill, no batter. And the logic, apparently, you may have come across this, the logic apparently was that they're so precarious that if a, a sheep tried to get over them, the, 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 the rock would fall off and squash them. <laughs> and, and actually... They're not intended for really uh, determined livestock retention. So around the perimeter of the tenement, the perimeter of the holding is proper Cornish hedges. And they say a good edge will put a sheep on its back. And if you look at the one that, that, um, uh, that Sean's been building at Kadroya, you cannot imagine a sheep getting up and over it. It doesn't even need a corbelled uh, parapet on the top. Um, but the, the, these, these hedges were the, more like the droveways between fields, whereby your cows know you don't climb over that. So you don't need the full bore thing. So yes, we're talking about a lot of variety. Our, uh, our ambition with Kadroya is to showcase as many different styles as we can. I haven't got a plan for that, Nick. It's very organic. As we go, we'll go. Um, at different points, different people will contribute. Um, it will be, uh, it will be what it is. And that yes is my answer. Let's do that. Why don't you come up one weekend and we'll do a section that's uh, just completely random. How's about that? I, I would love to. I'd love to. I'll bring the granite with me. Right. Yes, yes, you're mute, muted, I'm afraid. I thought I'd press the button. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. So a lovely question from Christine Mason. Where do we send small donation to help with funds? Small, any donations are very, very welcome. Um, if you email hello at goldentree.org.uk, um, then we'll send you our details. We can either for PayPal or for a bank transfer. That would be very appreciated. I don't know. I've pen with Landscape Partnership or a, a charity and accept accept donations. <laughs> I don't know if they, but um, yeah, to, if you want to contribute towards Kadroya, we can definitely uh, make sure your funds go towards that. That would be very welcome. Um, so a question from Cheryl, is there a particular book um, you would recommend on Cornish hedges and their history, or are you writing one? So I'm sure that both Will and Nick will okay. probably have something to say about the this. The short answer is no, there is not a book. And the reason I'm not writing one is because Robin Mania has already done it. Yeah, it's just, just what I was going to say. paper, yeah. it's online. So if you go to cornishhedges.co.uk, it's a really clunky old website. I think he, I think um, it was last updated in 2007, 2008. Uh, I actually don't know what year <laughs> Robin died. Uh, maybe Nick can tell us how long ago Robin died. Yeah, not five years ago. Five years ago, yeah. Um, but this, this, this website, cornishhedges.co.uk, stick at it because you won't understand how to navigate. 
yeah. and you'll get lost. And then you'll go in around the back and find another load of information that you didn't even realize was there. It's extraordinary. It's got so yeah. much info and it's a delight. Uh, please, please go and look at that. And in some ways it's more fun than a book because you kind of go on a perambulation around the website and find all this information. Um, maybe one day, um, uh, and we are, we are uh, in communication with Sarah, um, Robin's widow, um, and maybe one day we might turn it back into a book, perhaps with some gorgeous photos, uh, as sent in to Nick Taylor's um, favourite hedge photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I completely um, agree that the the the, the um, Cornish Hedge website is is the best place to go to. It is absolutely labyrinthine. But there is a book that Robin Muneer put together called Wildlife Rev Revival in Cornish Hedges, a little slim one. It's very hard to track down, but it is. It, so there is a book that talks specifically about the wildlife. So that, that, that if you can find that, that's that's a, a good resource. I'm, I'm going to plug a book which has got a terrible title now. It's not mine, but it's called. Uh, yeah, it, it's it. But it is actually very. Um, it, it's respectful and, and talks about Cornish hedges as well. So I'd recommend this book, it's A Natural History of the Hedgerow, and it says, and ditches, dikes, and dry stone walls. It's also, and also hedges, shouldn't it? Cornish hedges on there, but by John Wright. So I'd, I'd recommend that one. That's a good read. Lovely, and then I think we've got time for one more, um, just quickly. Uh, and someone's asked where they, this has been recorded, so where will um, people be able to find this talk afterwards, um, Nick? So it will be on the, the PLP, the Penwith Landscape Partnership YouTube channel. There's quite a bit of me going on about hedges on there as well, which I don't know whether you're interested or not, sort of rambling on about hedges and get this. Some I'd like to point out that I didn't know you were recording it and I, <laughs> I may not give my permission. Oh, to be confirmed. <laughs> oh, to be confirmed. Um, yeah. Who knows what rubbish I came out with? I don't know. It's a bit embarrassing, but um, yeah. Thank you. I'm sure it will be lovely. We we can review it and edit any bits that you don't want in it, Will. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I've got one on the PLP final... website directly. But one final thing. Um... Someone said, I've been making, uh, this is from Sean, making little videos on Cornish Edges on, for TikTok on walks, didn't know much about them. Oh, just saying thank you. Not, not a question. Thank you very much, Sean. Sean, I know you. your name and... from um, your frequent Twitter contributions, uh, uh, but I'm too old to understand TikTok, and I don't know that I'm never going to go there quite, but I'm sure you're doing a lovely job. <laughs> I think that's all the questions. Nick. I think we're done. So I think we'll round up now. Will, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. I'm super inspired and I get the feeling everybody else is as well. It's been a great talk. So that's absolutely brilliant. Perfect. So wonderful. Okay. I think that we can say cheerio to everybody now. <laughs> Again, if we. <laughs> <laughs>